All right, let's start. <clears throat> if you remember in the um, Popper lecture, I mentioned that there's been some problems in science, which you could call the credibility crisis, the re reproducibility crisis. And Vlad will talk about that in a bit more detail next lecture. And the, problem, the problems occur all the way from preclinical medicine, where they were first noted, to psychology. And indeed, in the survey of nature, many scientists from many disciplines thought there was a reproducibility problem within the discipline. So that, that's really the motivation for what I want to talk about, is that we have um, a crisis in science and that things aren't being done quite how they should be. And we're not getting the quality science that we should be getting, given the resources, uh, people's time and money that, that goes into it. And I think part of the problem is the way science is governed. So my, um, my conjecture will be that at the heart of science, the very way it works is a democratic process. And for it to work best, it should be embedded within democratic processes, both at the level of the university and society um, in which it occurs. So Popper said that um, knowledge grows by critical discussion. And traditionally, when you have a, a school of thought, that isn't how it operated. Traditionally, you had a master, and um, the master said to the student, this is the way we do things. This is the solution. And the task of the student was to pass on that solution and keep it as pure as possible. So you, you, you see this way of thinking um, all around the world in, in many areas. And, and if you want to say, if there's some argument about how things are done, you would say, you try and argue that this is the way the master, no, it's this way that the master originally did it. This is the oldest way of doing it, and this is the best method, therefore. It's, it's pure by way of being what was first said by the great master at the beginning of that school of thought. But that isn't how knowledge grows. That's an attempt to ossify a way of thinking um, as it is. Just here's one possible solution. We're going to keep it as it is. So there's another um, tradition, Popper said, where what the master says is, here's a problem. This is my proposed solution. But the master says to his very student, typically has been his, um, now can you do better? And then the student tries to improve on what they were taught. That's the critical tradition. Where the teacher encourages the student to do better than what the teacher did. To find their own answers, to find their own solutions. To criticise what's on offer so you can come up with something better. So Popper had one conjecture that there was... Uh, one striking start to the critical tradition. I think he, I think he was he was wrong about that. He didn't start once in one one time and place. But it was a particularly striking start that uh, uh, led to dramatic consequences. And that was around 600 BC in Greece. Thales gave up on mythological explanation for natural phenomena. So if you consider earthquakes, he didn't say, well, there was an earthquake because Zeus had an argument with Hera and he was very angry and so that's why we have an earthquake now. He, he tried to come up with um, explanations um, for which he could 
give reasons for. So he said, um, um, you know how things float on water? They can, they can move about. And when we have an earthquake, it seems to me like that could be the, the earth is floating on infinite water. Uh, and uh, sometimes, therefore, it moves. It can grate against other bits of earth. And that's an earthquake. So we're trying to give a naturalistic um, explanation. Now, according to tradi tradition, his pupil was an Aximander. But his pupil had a completely different notion of how things worked. The people said, well, infinite water and then the earth floating on top. Um, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But what if um, the earth is held up by nothing? But the reason why it doesn't fall down and the reason why we don't need the, this infinite water the, the earth is floating on um, is that it's equidistant from everything else. So by principle of symmetry, there's nowhere to fall. So he criticised his master and actually came up with a really good idea, a profound idea. The earth could be sitting in space and there was no need for it to fall by symmetry. He hadn't thought through the symmetry argument completely because he thought the Earth was a drum and we're standing on one side of the flat drum but there's another flat side on the bottom. It was only a couple of generations later when all Greeks accepted the Earth was round. It was a sphere. So that's how fast things were moving. But critical tradition takes twists and turns, so Anaximander's pupil, by tradition, was Anaximenes, uh, and he criticised his master and came up with something else. It was probably a little bit of a step backwards, but as I say, in the fullness of time, they, they got to a much better solution, the spherical Earth. And then there was an explosion of knowledge. That was the, Greek, the explosion of Greek knowledge in around about 500 to... 300 BC and carried on for actually a few, quite a few centuries after that. So according to Popper, the foundation of both science and democracy is the open society, which is the society that encourages the critical tradition. In other words, when people disagree with you, they're not just tolerated but respected. They're valued for the for what comes out of disagreement and critical discussion. And that applies not just to the growth of knowledge in, in sciences or uh, any sort of intellectual activity, but also to how society operates. How are we going to make decisions in a society? Well, you can either have a person in charge who is there uh, by force and can only be removed by bloodshed, but that's not the critical tradition. That's not the open society. Or you could have uh, arguments or policies or people um, who are there or not there because of those arguments. Then that would be the open society. You can have... Um, if the open society is embedded in the very way, in, in the very structure of how a society works, that's a democracy. You can have an open society without a democracy if the person in charge encourages the critical tradition. But then um, the critical tradition and the open society is only there on the whim of the autocrat. And so the next autocrat might not like it and that will be the end of it. And history does show that happen as well. And what we, what we see in ancient Greece is the, the politics, the open society in politics and the open society in science and intellectual activity, running along side by side in a very striking way. So Thales I mentioned, 
uh, 600 BC. That was the very point of Solon was introducing voting and beginning to introduce democracy into the Greek system. Fully fledged democracy really comes 508 BC when Cleisthenes introduced what I, and I'll show you um, this amazing period of Athenian democracy. Uh, Alexander the Great um, reduced it, 322 BC, because he became the supreme ruler. Uh, and then when the Romans took over, that was more or less the end of it, although some of the institutions carried on in a sort of a shadow format. Meanwhile, while that's going on, we have these amazing developments in astronomy, in mathematics, and you get some of the first histories where history isn't just a mythological account, uh, but based on witnesses and um, going out and talking to people to piece together history that's happening. You get medicine with Hippocrates. He doesn't claim that everything he does works. He, he, um, he describes many failures of his therapeutic techniques. By the time we get to Galen... Um, I think it was about 150 AD. Everything Galen did, according to Galen, absolutely worked fantastic all the time. So we've lost the critical tradition by that point. So in both these cases, you can say um, there was an overcoming of shame, the shame that kept you quiet. Everyone had a right to a voice. It didn't matter who you were. And I come to that in the political context here. Because um, Athens set up, starting with Cleisthenes, uh, this system. First thing he did when he when he set it up was he broke up the um, the aristocratic hierarchy. So people were assigned to ten different tribes. You, you didn't belong to the clan defined by an aristocrat. Instead, he he assigned people to tribes. And he mixed them all up, so each tribe contained people from the urban centre, from the countryside and the coast. And then they had their own games uh, uh, to play and festivals, so they had a sense of being part of the group. So he broke up the old power structures. Then the main executive body here, 500 people, were selected 50 each year by lot, in other words, random assignment, and they had special machines for randomly picking, randomly selecting. Uh, 50 people from each tribe, um, more or less randomly selected to be in the boule, the executive council that ran Athens. Um, to be on the executive body, you had to be over 30, and uh, there were some wealth requirements that gradually got, got produced. But there are probably only about 20,000 eligible people. The boule is replaced completely every year, so you can't be selective when you're doing this. Probably pretty much everybody, well, really high proportion of people, took part in being on the executive for Athens, given you satisfy the requirement of being over 30 and having some minimal wealth, which was eventually reduced. They, they are in charge of the day-to-day -day running of, um, of Athens. Um, each month, one tribe was, a, was the main um, group of people uh, running it. And every day, they picked a different person from the tribe to be the leader, to be like the president of Athens, the prime minister. Every day was a different person. So that person would be the person who would go out and do business with other states and countries and... And, and represent the whole of this, this state, this country. They would um, set an agenda and implement decisions, and the agenda uh, on eventually became weekly, uh, and certainly a main one monthly, was in the popular assembly where all citizens could go. So that was males um, over 20, so it's not quite what we call all citizens by today's standards, but it was not bad for those days. It excluded um, foreign visitors and a ton of slaves. 
So I'm not saying it was great, but um, still, in the context of its time, given that all the other thousand Greek states had uh, widespread misogyny and slaves as well, this, the democratic version was, uh, 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 was incredible, really, by comparison. So then everyone could vote on the motions put forth and suggest motions. Anyone could stand up and suggest a motion. Anybody could vote on it. And then introduced, sort of about a hun after about 100 years of this was going, was a, um, a special sort of committee, the Nomothetai, which was selected by lot from the population. So, the, so we're not talking about elites at any, at any point here. They consider the legislation and the, and the rules that the assembly, the ecclesia, has nominally approved, but they sit down and think about it, and they take the time. Is this consistent with our previous rules? Is this really going to work? So there's a check on the process here. And we'll come back to this, to this idea of having a random selection of citizens to form an assembly to really inform themselves about a key matter and make decisions about it. Citizens' assembly is something you might have heard about. So, th so this was democracy was ruled by the people, and this really was ruled by the people. You didn't have a leader, which changed every day. That leader was ran more or less randomly selected from a, a wide population. So the Athenians were known, and these, the Athenians were sort of the, um, the first and the most prominent democracy, but in the thousand Greek states there were a lot of democracies. Uh, there were a lot of tyrannies where there was one person in charge, like a king, uh, but it might not be a king, just an autocrat. And there are oligarchies where there was committees of people regarded as being the best, the most talented, who would run the shop. And when you look um, back as... Um, the Stanford classicist Josh Ober has done, at how well those different states did, which you can do by looking at um, uh, sort of archaeology, pottery, fragments, and so on. You can look at their wealth uh, and um, artistic output and so on. The democracies outperformed other types of government in that highly competitive environment where you're keeping things roughly constant, same amount of misogyny, slavery, and so on. But what's different is democracy versus one-man rule or several people rule. And democracy wins out. And the Athenians were known as being knowledgeable and engaged. Of course, you would be. You're constantly involved in the political process. You're part of it. There are no elites to rail against. You are the elites. You are the decision makers. You have as good a chance as anyone of making a decision about anything of importance. So what it, um, we just have a little discussion with the person next to you now and just think about how is the Athenian democracy different from the democracy that we have today in the UK. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that.
So um, what we have is a representative democracy, uh, which means we elect people to then make the decisions for us. We, we trust they'll do a good job. So when you elect people, uh, the people have to stand out in some way. Um, so the people you elect are not going to be the average person. Because people are going to be drawn to vote for someone who stands out from the average person. That's how they get votes in the first place. So if you wanted non-average people ruling, and you might, an election is a way of doing it. So it, what it used to be regarded as what we now call representative democracy was actually a form of elitism. And the, the Athenians had that system. They had about 1,000 posts uh, that needed filling for the year. Most of them were signed by lot, but there were 100 that were done by election in the General Assembly. And that included the 10 generals, because they wanted people of military capability to be generals. Right? So that they did do some elections when you think you wanted some elite involved. Um, so looking at it th that way, I think the Athenian system, which has a minimal amount of elections and more engagement of the ordinary person by the process of um, random selection, and then maybe in training them up and informing them on an issue so they really consider in detail before they make the decision. Um, it's the only system I know of that, uh, that um, avoids elite entrenchment. I know of no other system in the world that escapes elite entrenchment. And elite entrenchment has been argued to be a cause of decay in any system because you get certain people stuck at the top, they get more corrupt by being stuck at the top, they just um, hoard things for themselves and their children and so on, and the system starts to, to fall apart, slowly corrode and break down. Now, Hand, I heard some um, comments here. Some, I think someone, one of you said, how, how would you get anything done? Um, and um, I, I, I had Josh Ober come over to give a talk in 2015 because he recommended moving companies over to the Athenian way of doing things. And he says there has to be buy-in. In other words, when you join the institution, you just have to accept that part of your duties, as it were, in working there will be taking part in the decision-making process. Uh, I'll come to later how that, how that can work in practice, uh, but one of the things people say is, at least in the, um, to the small experiences they've had over it, that it was intensely engaging and enjoyable and they want to do more of it because they felt important and they made a difference. Now, I haven't had direct experience in the institution of the whole institution being run completely like this, um, but that's an issue where we're going to consider. And you do need to give people compensation. So the Athenians started doing this as well. When you went to the assembly, you got paid for it. When you went to the courts by a lot, you got paid for it to compensate for the loss of work uh, in, in taking that day off. So what we have is this, um, I think, an amazing experiment that lasted several hundred years, uh, longer than our fully-fledged democracy has, has lasted, that engaged people to the full in decision-making, um, made everyone feel they were, their opinion <clears throat> was worth stating, they were valued. We have a political process like this that went hand in hand with a spectacular growth in knowledge. So maybe that's no coincidence. So what I found interesting about this book, Timothy Ferris, was how uh, since the Enlightenment, um, democracy and science always went hand in hand. Whichever was the most op open society and democratic society was where scientists flocked and science flourished. And scientists were often the people who pushed for more democracy in the more closed societies. So the argument of the book uh, is that, um, indeed, you can see in America, in Europe, and other places, the growth of knowledge going hand in hand with an open political 
society. So far, this has been a uh, Western-centric view of the growth of knowledge. And knowledge didn't just grow in the West. One place where there was steady growth of knowledge was China. And Joseph Needham um, became very interested, he was a scientist, became very interested in what was known in China and when was it first, when was some particular innovation first discovered. Now what you see in China is, uh, according to Needham, is pretty much a slow progress in knowledge. You don't see the exponential takeoff um, that you saw in Athens. A bit later, about a thousand years, around about a thousand AD in the Arab world, um, what happened there is, a, is an example of um, an autocrat, a caliph, promoting the open society, but then his successor closing it down again, and the next one might be opening it up, so you see some fits and starts, and then eventually closing down completely. But then you have exponential takeoff again around the Enlightenment. What you see in China is gradual growth. But you, you see this steady, steady growth happening way before things start to pick up in Europe after, after Athens. So he, what became known as the Needham question is a question Joseph Needham asked. Why had modern science not developed in China but only in Europe? And the question he regarded as all, all the more pressing because before the 14th century, in other words before the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, Europe was almost wholly receiving from Asia rather than giving. So some examples Needham goes through. They, China mastered iron casting 15 centuries before Europe. They invented paper in AD 105. A wheelbarrow, 1,000 years before, before Europe did. Ninth century invented gunpowder. Uh, we think of the um, movable type printing press as invented by Gutenberg. Um, but it was invented 400 years before Gutenberg by Bishan in China. Uh, we're all grateful for inoculation, and that was a technique that started in China. Mechanical clocks, six centuries before Europe, and on and on. Needham has thick volumes going through how things were invented in China. So they were often a thousand or more years ahead of the West. So how did it happen that they could be, have such a sophisticated society that science did not take off in China. Well, China um, truly valued knowledge. Um, I think at the time, 500 BC, there was a sort of open society in that you had different schools of thought like Confucius, Lao Tzu, uh, Taoism, and the different Chinese schools, all sort of debating and arguing with each other um, before things settled down couple hundred years later, and then, then pretty much as when China unifies, you have, a, you have autocratic rule thereafter, but a re deep respect for knowledge. And a, merit a meritocratic system in the civil service where people would sit exams based on the classics, and that's how you could advance in the, in the civil service. They'd be tasked with that as well. And scholars were intensely respected. When you, when you read the sort of the love stories and romances of China, it's the scholar who's the gentleman that women fall in love with. So you can understand why, and, and the state supported knowledge growth when it was directly applied and in the interest of the state. Um, so, what's, so that just presses the question even more. So why didn't science take off? And this is what Needham says. There was no modern science in China because there was no democracy. Science is indifferent to who makes the argument. Those civilizations which have developed an exaggerated respect for teachers will have to modify it. Shades of the, um, of the schools of thought that I started with. We have to respect the teacher, do as the teacher says, and preserve the doctrine. There is a real kinship between the scientific mind and the democratic mentality. 
which includes, according to Needham, scepticism, anti-authoritarianism, not letting others decide on aims or assessments of evidence, a give and take, a live and let live attitude. So that's my case from um, history, where um, democracy and the growth of knowledge tend to go together. That's not to say you can't have some knowledge grow outside of democracy, as I've said, you can. But there's a synergy when they occur together. Because, uh, I think Popper hit the nail on the head, they both involve the open society, crucially. It's the fundamental way that they work. So contrast uh, that thought with what's happened to our universities in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, so when I started, well, I started um, 31 years ago, working as a lecturer, uh, and then universities were reasonably democratic. They weren't structured entirely in an efficient way. Clearly they could do with some reform, but it, there, was, there was a form of democracy where when the faculty made decisions, those decisions counted. Now we don't make decisions. And, and this has happened across the UK almost simultaneously in the last 10, 20 years. U universities are now governed in a completely top-down fashion. A, a uh, departmental meeting is one where you're hearing the results of decisions that have been made by the management and those above you. And that's come with a, a form of managing science called managerialism, where um, the worth of the people working in the institution is determined by set performance goals. Things like getting grants, the more money you pull in, the more valuable you are. Publishing in high impact factor journals. And the, the, the duty of the researcher is to fulfill the key performance indicators of the institution, to publish in certain journals with high impact factors, to pull in certain amounts of money. That's what gets you respect, not the quality, per se, of your ideas. <coughs> if you had brilliant ideas you published in a not-so-good journal, that doesn't count. You may have influenced a lot of people with that, but still point of view of managers, you didn't satisfy the key performance indicators. So Ben Martin, who's in the Science Technology Policy Research Unit at Sussex, um, thinking about this, said, why when the management literature of the past two decades has stressed the benefits of flatter organisational structures, in other words, not so much hierarchy, <laughs> decentralisation, have many universities been intent on in moving precisely the opposite direction? of more hierarchical structures and top-down management. In other words, what he's trying to say is the way we're now managing our science, not just UK but worldwide, doesn't even fit with what the management schools in those universities would say is the best way of managing a knowledge institution. So when you, when you have decentralised organisations... Uh, according to Martin, I'm not, not an expert on the management literature, you have more innovation and creativity when you don't have hierarchical, top-down, autocratic control. And you, you have increased motivation and satisfaction because people are engaged. Their opinion counts in a proper democratic institution. When it's top-down control, your opinion does not count. You just do as you're told. So he quotes uh, by at all, he says that the managerialism we've been having has created an environment that encourages opportunistic, opportunistic behaviour such as cronyism, rent-seeking. Rent-seeking means getting what you can for yourself. The rise of organisational psychopaths, which will lead to a waste of resources, change for the sake of change, management always likes to change things, restructure things, uh, bureaucratisation, and a disheartened and exploited workforce. Uh, and in this book, which um, interviewed people from many UK institutions, 
at, at all level of status within those institutions, uh, came to this conclusion. The sense that the conditions for the pursuit of high-quality academic work have worsened and are continuing to worsen is widespread, even in institutions that are most obviously successful. Criticisms that universities have become too top-down in the governance and are insufficiently bottom-up, that good academic work is stifled by over-regulation and bureaucracy, and that too much academic business is now handled by non-academic professionals are commonplace. So that's the UK situation. Um, the fall of the faculty gives a horrifying account of the same thing happening in the US, uh, somewhat predating the UK. And the European situation is better. Um, you do have democratic governance in many European institutions, but it's moving in the same direction. It's all moving to top-down control. Okay. So your pin is 9518. So I'm going, to, I'm going to make some suggestions for how any institution might be run differently based on the Athenian example um, and think about the, the main goal is to think about how that applies to science in general so we can not have the, the problems that we've been having in science with this credibility crisis. But the issues are rather general and I was interested to see this book by Onig come out about um, foreign aid agencies and looking at when you have top, complete top-down control guiding everything, how well that works out for foreign aid organisations and the different projects. He gives an example in East Timor where they wanted uh, the uh, farmers to um, uh, improve how the, their farming practices to make them more productive. So the, the goal was to train up the government workers who dealt with the farmers so that government workers would have the knowledge to um, guide the farmers in, in what they should be doing. And the, the, the measured output of the, of the program was the number of trained government workers. Now, the people working on the ground realised that what was happening was you train up the government workers and give them lots of skills, they'd go off and get better paid jobs. So the farmers weren't being benefited. What, what you'd really want to do is to train the farmers... This is what the people on the ground realised. But they decided to do nothing about it and tell HQ far away and distant because the, the, the measure of the success of the aid programme was the number of trained government workers. And the programme was really successful by this measure. It just had zero impact on the farming practices in East Timor. And the, the problem there was top-down control. And the people at the top don't know what's happening at the bottom. They're not there. They don't know the details. But the people on the bottom can often make better judgments. They can navigate the situation that's really happening because they're right there in the thick of it and they have information about what would be really useful. So complete top-down control breaks down in that situation. So when you have hard-to-measure outcomes, which I think you do in science, how do we know what a creative, useful solution is? Unless in the fullness of time we can evaluate it, you know, ten years later. But at the time, it's hard to evaluate. So there's something called good arts law that relates to what I've just told you about the farmers, which is when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And one of the classic examples of that was when the, the French uh, had uh, Vietnam as a colony, and in Hanoi there were too many rats, and they had trouble getting rid of the rats. So they said to the people, uh, we'll pay you for every rat tail you give us. 
but the rats didn't go down. In fact, they seemed to be increasing. And the reason was the, people, the, um, the locals realised if they ran some rat farms, they could make a ton of money. <laughs> and I'm afraid this is what's been happening in science. You tell people you need, you need to be published in high-impact factor journals. The best way of getting it in there is p-hacking. If you know what p-hacking is, I think Vlad is going to tell you, but his lecture's moved to next time. It's when you play around with lots of different statistics until you get the result that you want. So it's not good science. You shouldn't be doing it. I mentioned in the Popper lecture how you can stop that sort of thing with a, re with a registered report for registration. But when you reward people <coughs> for getting in high-impact factor journals, and the journals want exciting results, results to boost their impact factor, that incentive structure is a bit like rat tails in Hanoi. You are producing people who will pee pack their way and be salespeople to give really good bullshit for why this should be published and why it's so exciting. And you're going to reward them for how much grants they put in, so they're going to be really inefficient to get tons of money, even if they don't do much with it. That's what you get with the incentive structure we currently have in science, a bunch of bullshitting pee hackers who waste money. And that's not good science. So it's an interesting simulation of this. How this sort of bad governance that we have is is ruining science. Because what we've set up is a natural selection process, this paper shows. Well, let's say you have a lab that trains people to pee, hack, and bullshit. They'll get tons of paper in the high-impact factor journals. They'll get tons of grant money. Because they get the grant money, they're going to train up a lot of PhD students and postdocs in their ways of dealing with things. And so in that natural selection amongst labs, it's the ones that game the system that we're now. Now, can we change it? And I'm just going to mention a subsequent simulation they did, where instead of handing out grant money to people with the most publications, or something like that, or in the, the, in the highest impact factor journals, let's say part of the ecosystem uh, is where grants are handed out in the following way. First of all, you just check that the grant application passes minimal standards. And then you assign by lot, random selection, just as the Greeks did, 500 BC. This then breaks that cycle, and in in, in according to their simulations, was the best way of breaking the, uh, that natural selection process that I was just talking about. Gives everyone a fair chance. Has a certain impartiality about it. As a side note, in terms of equality and diversity, it means it doesn't matter what race, gender, country you come from, if the money is assigned by lot. It breaks down elitist hierarchies. It gives everyone a chance. Notice the Athenian feel to this solution. So how could we change things? What sort of structure um, would be consistent with the culture of the critical tradition? Because in Athens there was a certain culture that was brought about by the governance processes. Because people were engaged, they were informed, that created the culture culture of argument and discussion, of contribution and participation and engagement. Okay, so I'm going to assume, just thinking about a university now, each academic has information about how the university is working. The university is a complex thing. It's not like a car production factory. There's lots of little niches and nooks and crannies that work in slightly different ways with its own problems depending on the discipline and the sorts of projects that go on and so on. So different people have different relevant information. But people aren't going to express that information unless they have some job or function to express it. You can know about it and you can complain to your mate about things. But it's not going to go anywhere unless it's some duty you have, some job that you have, in order to make use of that information. 
And also, I think, that decisions will be made best, best use of the information. The people making decisions have to live by them. In other words, we don't have a separate management class who makes decisions, and they, they don't have to live by them. They don't have to do them. They're not working on the, on the shop floor as well. Now, another thing about the Athenian system was it selected ideas, not people, by and large. If you propose an idea, I mean, Pericles was an influential person, Pericles, in, in Athens, uh, and a lot of his ideas were taken up. But when he started saying things people didn't like, they didn't take up his ideas. Some people will be full of good ideas more than others, and that's fine. But what you want to select for is the ideas, not the people. Now, remember the nomotheti, which is this little group where you randomly select some citizens and then you inform them on a topic and give them some time to think through a particular issue. And then they make the decision on it, the final decision. That's the basis of a deliberative poll, um, which is something that James Fishkin has been using for decades in many different countries. You randomly select from a population, say 200, 300 people. And you always use about 200, 300. He's done deliberative polls in, say, the whole of Europe. He's randomly selected people from Europe. Or Australia. Or Texas. Or we'll see a township in China and so on. But 200 to 300 people gives you a fairly precise estimate of their votes when we, when we come to it. Put them into groups of 15 to discuss an issue. And they're given information packs. The issue could have been something like Brexit, for example. It could be you know, any issue of importance like that. Or in a, in, a, in a university like Sussex, size and shape. The issue that being been talked about. One pack argues one way for a certain issue. Some experts prepared that who were on that side. The other pack argues the other way. People discover it, uh, discuss it, and there's a moderator there who tries to make sure everyone has a voice, no one's dominating conversation, and everyone treats each other respectfully. So you can disagree with someone, but you can't insult them. You have to bite your tongue when it comes to that, no matter what you think, and just express arguments for and against the different positions. So he, he trains his moderators to do this well, and he presents evidence that they've, that they've done it well. And then when you've got questions, he has a panel of experts. You can go and ask them any unresolved questions. And then they vote. Anonymously. Now, the way Fishkin puts it is, because you've randomly selected from the population, this is what the people, and it's the people, not any bunch of elites, because you've randomly selected from the population, is what the people would think if they had reflected on the issue. So it's not like a referendum where people don't even probably understand the issues and then they say, yeah, and they just go with what someone told them or they heard, uh, heard on the radio or YouTube or whatever. This is after maybe two full days, or you can have considerably longer than that in other citizens' assemblies, of debating, reflecting on the issues for and against. So it's what the people would think if they reflected. I'll give you one example in practice. Um, so you can run the interesting thing about this is it's sort of politically neutral it's not left wing, it's not right wing so even a uh, sort of authoritarian government like China were willing to take it on board in some cases so in, in this uh, water town um, the council wanted to know how to spend some money, they had 30 projects a uh, random sample of 275 citizens, of these 235 completed the poll so of those randomly selected, a very high proportion, incredibly high in this particular case, actually took part. So it's a genuine random sample. The only way you can do this is if you have the resources which Fishkin had to um, pay for childcare, compensate people for loss of work, transport them and so on. He found that people did become more informed when he tested their knowledge. Force, force choice quest, chess, they knew more about the issues. Um, he found, because of the good work the moderators, facilitators were doing, um, there wasn't domination. Say, if you looked at the position taken by the better educated people, <coughs> half the time people moved away from what the better educated thought, and half the time they moved towards it. There was no domination. 
um, and he shows there is not other uh, effects that you might not want in a group situation like this. Uh, so towards away from the male preference, um, and um, actually moved away from the economically more advantaged in four out of five of the issues. What people came up with, things that would be useful to them, like um, better sewage works and parks for the children to play in. And it wasn't the things that the council thought the people would choose or that they thought they wanted, like a big public square, make the town look grand. But the council went with what the people said. Another way of doing this uh, that has happened in Oregon is now part of the official system there, is you have a, a, a group like that that debates the issue before a referendum and produces an information pack. So the people then, when they, the whole population, when they do the referendum, gets an unbiased account of the arguments for and against and how people decide it. Not information pack produced by a special interest group. So how could we apply that to university governance? This is how our flow of power happens now. We have senior management tell the deans what to do and the deans tell the schools what to do. Senior management chairs the committees, like teaching and learning committees that you may be on if you're a student rep, and they tell the schools what to do. Control is top down. Is that how science works? No. You don't have one boss scientist who tells everyone else what to do. Everyone can have an opinion and criticise anyone else. So why don't we change it? Uh, and um, one could change it by keeping the same structure and a really radical change was you get rid of permanent management and you select by lot into these different committees, just like the Athenians did. You could have deliberate polls, like I've been talking about, that could be set up to deal with particularly complex issues. That could, that could propose agenda items or solutions to agenda items for the executive committee. You could have people who don't like a decision. If you get enough signatures together, you can trigger a reconsideration of decisions because enough people thought it, you wanted it to be reconsidered. You could have an assembly of citizens that deals with and sides on proposals from the executive committee, just as Athens did, which include all sorts of citizens of the university like yourself. So would that help a university? It would be a radical difference from what we have now. Would it help science? So that's the question, in fact, I'm asking you to deal with in your essays. I'd be pretty excited to see and a try at this. And you could start small by just doing a deliberative poll on some issues and build up. But that would be a sort of a fully-fledged radical change in governance, completely different to what we have now. I'm sure it would transform things. Would it transform it for the better, and how would we know? That's what I'll be asking you. Thanks.